Today we're really delighted to be joined by two experts on the panel. First of all, Professor Kevin Fenton, who from Public Health England, who's the London Regional Director, and then uh, Martin McRae as well, the Joint Chief Nurse for the NHS London. So we're really delighted that uh, the two experts are here with us today for the whole hour to answer all your questions about the COVID vaccine. After the interventions from Professor Fenton and Martin McRae, we'll also have uh, two uh, short uh, remark speeches from uh, Emel Dina, who is a specialist public health nurse and volunteer with the Luso African community in London, and also from Matteo, who is uh, uh, the COVID uh, emergency uh, project lead, uh, advocacy project lead at Doctors of the World UK, a uh, part of the Medicine, Medicine du Monde network. So, really grateful to have some views from the community directly with the community to hear about the lived experiences the experience on the ground as well about as about the latest public health uh, guidelines um so before we just start just again for those still joining on facebook and on zoom uh, please use the q a function on zoom to ask your questions we also received a lot of questions from eventbrite so we'll try to cover as many as possible until until the end of this hour as well as on facebook if you're watching live on facebook on the three million page Please do share this video stream with your groups, if you're part of nationality groups, especially in London, you know, Romanians in London, Polish citizens in London, do share this live stream to the group so everyone can watch live. Uh, the video will still be there after as well for you to share. And if you're watching now live, please do ask your comments, uh, your, your questions in the comments on Facebook. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Professor Kevin Fenton from Public Health England, London Regional Director, to give some of his remarks on the COVID vaccine. Kevin, over to you. Wonderful. Hello, Alexandra. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who's joining us to um, participate in this session uh, this afternoon. I'm just going to share a few slides because I've been asked to set the scene a bit by reflecting on where we are with the epidemic in London, the lessons that we've learned about how the epidemic has affected us and why the vaccine is so important. And I've also been asked to do a little bit of uh, focus on how the vaccine works and aspects of what it means for us as Londoners. So I'll just take uh, us through a few slides and then I'm really looking forward to your questions, to your reflections, as we go through the session this afternoon. So as you heard, I am the Public Health Director for London and I have been working with the city throughout the entire pandemic. And you know, I'll begin by just reflecting, hopefully you can see the slides, Alexandra. Um, yes, we can see the slides, thank you. Excellent. By just reflecting on the journey and the, the, that we've had over the past year with the pandemic, it has touched all of our lives. We have either known people who've been infected, we've perhaps lost family members or friends from the disease. We may not have been able to visit family and friends for more than a year because of the pandemic. And this slide, I think, just really shows the burden on London with more than 700,000 Londoners being diagnosed with COVID over the past year. And unfortunately, more than 15,000 people dying from the disease. And we can see here the two waves of the epidemic in the city and how people who've died within 28 days of the first positive result, how that uh, has taken place from the first wave in the spring of last year to the second wave over the autumn and winter uh, that we've just experienced. So it has been a huge toll on all of us as Londoners. What we also know is that as the epidemic has evolved, it hasn't been randomly distributed. There are groups within our city that have had a disproportionate burden of disease. Here I'm showing data looking at how ethnic groups across uh, the, the country have been affected by the pandemic. And we know that groups such as our South Asian communities or Black African and Black Caribbean communities have been disproportionately affected across the country. And certainly in London, we have seen similar impacts. But there are other groups, for example, those living in more deprived parts of the city who've also had a disproportionate impact of the disease. We've seen a disproportionate impact in people who are key workers working in, for example, the security industry, the construction industry, or industries such as the service industry where people are interfacing a lot with members of the public. And I know this is going to be relevant to many uh, Europeans living in our city 
as well. So the vaccination program is certainly one of the most important tools that we're going to have to enable us to really get ahead of this pandemic and hopefully help to keep rates of infection low and to allow us to return to some normal normality in our lives. I'm sure you're all very much aware that we have been vaccinating in the United Kingdom since December of last year, and the program has been accelerating in the first quarter of the year. And I'm really pleased that we have now more than 32 million people who received the vaccine nationally, and certainly in London, very high numbers of people being vaccinated. The program has been delivered by age cohorts, and I'm really pleased that now we're now moving into the 40 to 45 year, 40, 49 year old age groups. It means that more younger Londoners will begin to have access to the vaccine. And this is a really important time for us to, to, to ensure that we are continuing to mobilize around the vaccine. Now, one of the challenges that I think we are wanting to discuss with everybody today is how do we get all Londoners to take up the vaccine? And one of the things we've been looking at in London is what we're observing, which is lower rates of uptake, especially among white other communities, many of whom come from uh, Europe, especially Eastern Europe, but other parts of the world, such as the United States, Australia, and Turkey. And we have been looking very closely at our data for white other groups, with ethnic groups within London, because we are observing lower levels of vaccine uptake, greater levels of hesitancy in those groups compared to white British communities uh, within the country uh, and within our city. So some of the data are highlighted in this slide. As of the 18th of March, we know that um, in those aged over 60, for example, in the white other communities in London, there are more than 200,000 people in this ethnic group. Only 68% of that group has already been vaccinated compared to much higher levels uh, of white British in that age group. And this is particularly lower in London. And we know that there's more work that needs to do to encourage uh, members of European communities in the city to have access to the vaccine and to take up the vaccine. We also know that for these white other communities, especially European communities living in more deprived parts of the city, they also have lower levels of uptake as well. So we're seeing differences across racial and ethnic groups, especially for white Europeans living in the city, but especially if those communities are more deprived parts of the city. So finally, I've been asked to just reflect on how vaccines work. Um, you know, we're, we're gonna have a lot of time to answer your questions on this. The core principles for how the vaccines work really are built upon technology developed over many years. And it's been wonderful that over the last year, we've been able to get both political will, the funding, the research, and the regulatory approvals to get the vaccines out. But at the core, vaccines work by introducing in a safe way, particles of an inert vaccine virus into the body so that the body's immune system can recognize either the genetic material or the viral material and mount an immune response so that when the body is, uh, comes into contact with the real virus, which is circulating in the community, the immune response is already developed. Now, there are many ways in which you can develop e either a, a, an inactivated viral particle to stimulate the immune system. But most, if not all, vaccines are based upon that principle. And that is why getting a vaccine is important because it's a key part of ensuring that uh, you're able to uh, respond well to the vaccine. Now, my colleague Martin McCray will be speaking more about the safety of the vaccines. I'm not going to dwell on this slide, but I'm going to end by just reflecting on the importance of this moment in time. We have really all been affected by and suffering with this pandemic over the past year. We're now poised to have the most effective and most powerful tool to help us to control this infection. And you know, I really would like to encourage all of us to ask questions about safety, effectiveness, how it's developed, its content, listen to the scientists and listen to the experts who are delivering these programs on a day-to-day -day basis and make an informed choice an informed choice that can help to protect yourself, 
to protect your family and those close to you, and to allow you to return to the community and into society as safe as possible as we're now beginning the process of reopening. So Alexandra, with that, I need to end there. Thank you so much. Looking forward to the questions in a few minutes. Thank you very much for the presentation, Professor Fenton. Um, now, next up in the panel, we'll be looking more at the reality on the ground with the COVID vaccinations. And I would like to invite uh, Martin McRae, Joint Chief Nurse from NHS London, to tell us a bit more about the reality of the vaccines on the ground. So Martin, over to you. Brilliant, brilliant. thank you. Um, can I start very quickly just by thanking everyone. Um, uh, so many uh, Londoners, hail from Europe. So many of my colleagues hail from Europe. And it's only because of the work of those communities and my colleagues from across the European Union and beyond that we've been able to manage over the last 14 months. In all our professions, in, in the way we follow the social distancing rules, all of those things have been the contribution of Europeans to London's response. And I thank you for that. Uh, we couldn't have done it without you. The reality of the ground, on the ground, on the vaccine for me is driven by what I've experienced in the last 14 months. So over 14 months, I've been the incident director for the NHS in London. And every day I get an email that tells me how many people have died from COVID in our hospitals. And we're now over 18,000 in London. That's 18,000 families absolutely grieving because they've lost a loved one, needlessly, by this awful virus. So when on the 8th of December, it was announced that we could start a vaccination programme that has now saved over, we estimate, 10,000 lives already in the country, you can't imagine my sense of relief because we've got an opportunity along with the other measures we're taking, as Kevin says, to get back to normality. And millions of Londoners have come forward in those groups who are already able to have it to come forward, but some people have been more cautious. One or two go, I don't want it, don't want anything to do with it, had enough, um, and that's people's choice, that's fine. But the vast majority of people who haven't had the va vaccine so far have come with questions. Is it safe? And I can unequivocally say, yes, it's safe. Uh, they come and say, but the history of uh, my experience of the healthcare system has not been very good. Why should I trust you now? And there's been questions about trust. And I think we've got to acknowledge that uh, although we love to think we're the most trusted, trusted professions in the world, that actually we're not always trusted. And we look to our partners and our communities to actually stand with us on this question, to talk about uh, the efficacy and the safety of the virus. And then the other thing is people read stuff in the news and they say, but we see AstraZeneca is not safe, or I'm not sure about Johnson & Johnson. So as Kevin said, we'll happily answer all those questions. Um, uh, and Kevin will be sick of hearing me talk about this. Um, so Kevin, forgive me, but hopefully no one else has heard this. Um, in all of this hardship that we've lived through, I've lost loved ones. Uh, I haven't been able to go to the funeral of my cousin Joan, for example, because of the restrictions. Uh, in all of this hardship, all of that death, all of that illness, I've cried tears once. And that was on the day my wife sent me a text. She's a nurse. And she sent me a text and said, I've had my first dose of the vaccine. And I cried with a sense of relief. And I think, if anything I want to impart, is if I am that confident for a woman who I've loved all my adult life and been married to for... I think it's 32 years this year. She'll tell me otherwise when I get home tonight. It, if, I'm, if I care that much that she has the vaccine, I care that much for the other nine and a half million Londoners to have it too. So really it's a safe and effective way out of this awful pandemic. And I'll leave you with that message for the moment. 
Thank you very much for that, uh, Martin. Um, so before we go on to the 40 minutes or so of Q&A, uh, we'd like to hear some voices of people working with different migrant communities. We initially were supposed to have three speakers, uh, including Mihai Bika from Roma Support Group. Unfortunately, Mihai cannot join us today due to an emergency, uh, but I'm sure there will be like some questions around uh, the Roma communities or Roma landowners as well that we, we, we could address in the Q&A because he was going to speak to that uh, issue and his uh, brilliant work with the Roma communities in, in London. So I'd like to invite uh, first uh, El Medina to speak about her experience working with migrant communities in London. Uh, so El Medina, over to you. Everyone, thanks for the invite. And um, what, it's beautiful to see the number of people um, watching us and writing questions in the, in the Q&A section, because that's exactly what we're here for. So I have a short amount of time, so I'm going to be direct and I'm going to be uh, straightforward. Um, yes, I am a specialist nurse by trade, but within my community, I am a volunteer. And the community I serve is European, but it's also Black. So I see things through both those lenses. Uh, I see their needs and their, um, their fears and their concerns through those two lenses. And it, I, I smiled when um, Martin McRae mentioned the word trust, because that's, that's the word I hear the most when I'm on the ground with them. Um, on the ground, mostly through webinars and Facebook Lives and Instagram Lives, because unfortunately COVID has taken away that face-to-face -face connection we have with the community members. But I can happily say that the centers have reopened. Community centers are opened again. So we will be again able to see you face-to-face -face at a distance safely, but we'll be able to guide you and support you in making the right decision for yourself and for your family. So the group of people I work with, they are Europeans, they are mostly Portuguese, but they come from the five countries that were colonized by Portugal. So they are African descendants, they are Luso Africans, that's how we call them. And they are not very keen on mainstream media, just like Martin mentioned. They are not very keen on national television. They prefer their homeland TV. They prefer to hear it in their own languages and they don't focus too much on news. The news they are getting are unfortunately from mediocre web websites and from experts uh, who are sharing short videos, um, mostly from a paranoid background, but linked to some actual facts to make them plausible, to make them believable. And I come across many, many questions linked to those um, unrealistic concerns that uh, they're caught from these videos that are being shared over a hundred thousand times within the communities. They are, it's very widespread. And so why I'm here today is to tell you, listen to the experts, listen to us, um, ask your questions, allow us to clarify your doubts uh, from a safe and evidence-based point of view. Um, but I wanted to go just a little bit more about trust. Trust is a key word that I think everyone should be engaging with more. And I was really happy when Martin said it. Trust that the vaccines are not dangerous. Trust that the NHS will engage with us at our different levels of understanding but always with respect and dignity. Trust that the Home Office will not be knocking on our doors after we give our vaccine, take our vaccinations and give our details. Um, trust that we can get the same treatment even when we don't have an address. All those are issues around trust that are preventing different members of different communities, I'm sure not just my own, from coming forward and being vaccinated. Because deep down, those are real fears to them and to their families, and they need to be engaged with. Health professionals are seen as heroes, but they're also humans. They also might fall prey to personal bias, beliefs or ideologies, and sometimes they might follow some policies too blindly without considering the impact those policies might be having on the communities that need to be served. So that's the awareness I want to raise for the professionals in the room. And the message for the members of the community is, I'm here, Mihai would be here, uh, Matteo is here, we represent different communities. We represent you, so see us. Um, maybe you can develop some trust in us. So allow us to guide you through this difficult moment 
um, over this past year, that's been really hard in all aspects of what we call normal living. Um, so that's 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 what I wanted to say. That's what I've encountered uh, on the ground within my community, which is not small. I mean, Portuguese alone, we are around half a million. Data is not clear because not everyone is registered with their consulate, but we. Only 400,000 are registered, but we know for sure we are way more than that. And within the Portuguese community, the Luso Africans, we are between 60 to 70,000. So there's a lot of us here that need that care and attention, just like the white others in London um, require that help and attention. Um, and that's what I had to say. So thank you very much for the time. Thank you so much, Dina. It's so important to hear the lived experiences on the ground, as well as yeah, your comments about trust and how important trust is in many of our EU Londoner and European Londoner communities. Um, final, Our final speaker for today is, is Matteo from Doctors of the World UK, uh, who will be sharing some, uh, some slides as well. So Matteo, over to you when you're ready. I don't think we can hear you. I think you're on mute. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, sorry, apologies for this technical issue. Um, so here in, in, in today's presentation, I just would like to focus on two uh, parts. The first one will be kind of around uh, social excluded groups and how they can uh, still struggle to access the vaccine, even if there they are some of the demographic groups who tend to to, uh, to be more subject to COVID and suffer more from COVID. So last year, when we did the rapid needs assessment, we, are, we saw how some of the social school population are at increased risk of being exposed to COVID-19, uh, more likely to have poorly managed chronic health and less likely to have timely health care if they become unwell with COVID. And this is something that is also reflected in our uh, clinic and, and advice line, where we provide more than uh, more than a, a thousand um, advice line in, in, in 2020 and in 2019 there were more than 2,000 and a lot of them were still related to GP access and I will briefly talk about it in uh, of the importance of GP registration when trying to register uh, when trying to get the vaccine sorry and a lot of people who came to us had um, insecure immigration status and the, the, the speaker before referenced uh, the, the question of trust. And again, we see the trust uh, of the NHS and kind of, in, of the home office is one of the barriers uh, stopping people from coming forward to receive the healthcare that they are entitled to. And also we see also our poverty and homelessness are some of the other barriers or other like that they suffer from this at the same time. Uh, in terms of the entitlement, uh, regardless of your immigration status, you are still entitled to be tested for COVID-19, treated for COVID-19, and vaccinated against COVID-19. And the, uh, the Department of Health and Social Care have confirmed that COVID-19 are available freely uh, without immigration status check. And there is no... There is no need to kind of prove your identity when receiving COVID treatment or COVID vaccine. Uh, but to book the vaccine, a key uh, element that you need to have is a NHS, an NHS number. And to do so, you need to be registered with a GP. Um, there are some misconceptions in relation to register with a GP because we know that a lot of surgery tend to always ask for proof of ID or proof of address but they, are not, uh, they don't have the, the obligation to do so. They can still register you even without a passport or a proof of address. Um, what you can say if you get asked those documents, you can say that you live within the practice boundary and will, will, st will still like to be registered as a patient. Um, and if it's the first time, you can, uh, you can say it's the first time so, you can see, so that you can be allowed to receive your NHS number. To help in this effort, the NHS has also prepared some yellow cards, which um, some voluntary organization can receive directly from the NHS, which will allow people to kind of advocate for their own uh, registration, which again is very important as we will see later to uh, register to get the vaccine. 
if um, you, you or somebody you know doesn't have a fixed address, DGP practice can still register you by, for instance, putting the address of somebody you know, or also by putting the address of the surgery itself. When booking the vaccine appointment, um, you, you can book the appointment online, you will be asked for the NHS number. This is why it is very important to register with a GP. Um, and at least you need to give some phone number at least just to, to kind of um, get away for them to contact you for the second dose. Um, and then, sorry, finally, there are, we always receive questions in relation to the level of data sharing. What we know is that your information will not be shared with the Home Office Immigration Department when accessing primary care, uh, which is free for everyone regardless of immigration status. This includes GP services and COVID-19 testing. Other, other barriers that we have seen are include also, as we said before, the, the language barrier. So being able to kind of read all the information uh, related to the vaccine and COVID-19 and, and take an informed decision. Um, this is why in the last year we have been kind of translating official guidance into up to 60 languages. And we just published uh, the COVID-19 guidance translated into 30 languages, which are available on our website, where people can download those uh, documents and kind of read um, information official from um, NHS and Public Health England. So kind of take an informed decision and also share those documents in their community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matteo, and thank you again to all the speakers. Uh, we have a lot of questions uh, submitted already uh, via Zoom, pre-submitted questions, as well as quite a lot on Facebook as well. Um, so let's uh, get started with um, yeah, at least uh, 25 minutes or so of questions with uh, um, with Professor Fenton and with Martin McRae as well, and with uh, the community leaders so if they also want to contribute on some of the questions. Let's start with the shorter questions because I have some shorter and some longer questions. Uh, so a question from uh, Vanya on the Q&A here on Zoom. Any news on the blood clot uh, and AstraZeneca and also what is happening with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine? And I think this reflects a lot of the questions we've been getting today. So Martin or Professor Fenton, over to you. Shall I pick up on the on the two brands of vaccine? Um, that would be helpful. So Johnson & Johnson is a very easy one for us because we haven't approved Johnson & Johnson in this country. We don't use it. Um, it's not to say we won't, but we, we it, it wasn't one of the brands that we uh, have prioritised when we, as a country, ordered them uh, so many months ago. Um, we are watching with interest uh, the regulator in the United States uh, and the company themselves who together have decided to halt the rollout of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine in the States just whilst they understand it a bit more. Uh, and the link with AstraZeneca is, is the side effect that people are looking at. So you will recall over the past couple of weeks in the news, uh, there has been a, a lot of concern across Europe uh, there are two regulatory authorities. In this country, it's known as the MHRA. Uh, that's the, the independent organization that, that permits us to use a drug or not. Um, uh, it's equivalent in the European Union is something called the EMA uh, uh, and uh, the European Medical Agency. Uh, and, uh, and there were concerns in both of those regulators about very small number of reports of a very unusual and rare blood clot uh, being associated with people who had had the first dose of the vaccine. So let's be really clear, it's about the first dose, not the second dose. So if you've had the AZ vaccine and you have had no symptoms, you're quite safe, absolutely safe, to go back and have that second dose. You're not going to have, uh, it's, it's not something that could happen if you haven't had it the first time. So, so when I say a very small amount of people, as Kevin said, over 32 million people have received the vaccine. And we've seen about 19 to 20 episodes of these clots being reported. And they're, they're um, uh, cerebral. So they're, they come from the venous system in the, that drains away from the brain back into the heart. And, and, and there's some really, uh, uh, really small amount, as I say, uh, 
it works out about one in a million people are at risk. You're far more at risk of coming to harm from taking a 250 mile, 250 mile car journey at the national speed limit. You're far more likely to come to risk of being in a plane crash. And for some few people, they'll go, oh, that risk is too much. I don't want to get in the plane. But the vast majority of us go, well, when we were allowed to, got into planes, got into cars and travelled. So it's, so we encourage people to think about this by balancing the risk. What risk have I got of a side effect, about a one in a million, against what risk have I have if, or, of catching COVID and being ill because of it? And the older you are, the risk of that goes higher and higher and higher. So we know that if you're over 80, you're 70 times more likely to die of COVID than the rest of the population, 70. So, you know, if you're over 80, uh, you know, it, uh, what's the phrase uh, that I, I tell my children off these? And it's a no brainer. Yeah, it, it just is, you know, it, but the younger you get, the more you question it, and that's fine. But actually still the, the balance is still heavily weighted towards having the vaccine because it's safe and protects you than the small amount of vaccine. The one group who we've said should be offered an alternative to the AstraZeneca, and we have two alternatives, I'll mention them in a minute, um, are people under 30, because that's where we've seen the greatest number of these small number of cases. And the younger you are, it seems like you're most likely to do it. There's a, a, a really strong correlation with age. There's probably a correlation with gender. So if you're a woman, you're probably more likely to have it, but it's not as strong. But there are alternatives. Now, we don't offer people a choice. I, I have my vaccine because I'm an old man who works in healthcare and I've got a health condition. So I qualify every which way you can. Um, and um, uh, I was told I was having, uh, in my case, it was the Pfizer vaccine. Um, my wife was told she was having the AstraZeneca vaccine. You know, we just got what we were given. But if you're under 30, we will try and offer you either one of two others. One is, is the Pfizer vaccine, which we've been using since the beginning. And the other one is the Moderna vaccine that started to be used in the UK last week and is coming into London this week. So very small amounts of it, but they work in the same way. They're just produced by different laboratories and different companies. I hope that's helpful. Thank you very much for that. There's a more specific question here from Alda on Zoom as well, but this speaks to broader issues. It were some questions, the pre-submitted questions are on the same topic. So let's have this question. So Alda is saying, my 16 year old has been invited to take the vaccine because she has had scoliosis. Um, I am a bit concerned that it may affect her fertility. Is there any okay. reason for me to be all worried? Right. So El, El Medina is a nurse. We'll get this question quite a lot, I, I get, uh, I guess. Do, do you want to have a go at that with El Medina? Do you want me to do it? In this particular case, I would rather you do it because I actually know the person. All right. Fine. Now I'll do it. That's super. Let's not, let's not break that confidentiality. So um, 16 is really at the, the youngest age you can have the vaccine. It's not, um, a be underneath that, it's not allowed. But if your clinician, uh, your, your, your clinician is saying that you qualify, you should have the vaccine, um, uh, there is no connection with um, uh, infertility. And, and what we see a lot is, is uh, um, seeds of doubt being sown using things that appeal or, appeal most to people's hearts. So if you come from, if you're a young woman and someone says, oh, I'm not sure about fertility, that will raise concerns. If you come from a Catholic background, many people listening on this ground will know, they'll go, oh, you know, I've heard it's made, this, this is made from uh, unborn fetuses. Not true. Um, it will not affect your fertility. In fact, what I did a, a, a webinar for staff the other week with a fertility expert from the Homerton Hospital. And she was absolutely adamant. Women who are, um, and families who are trying to have children, if they qualify for the vaccine, they should have it because it protects them and their families. If women are trying with IVF, they should have it. And it will not affect your fertility. This is a really tried and tested technology over many years. 
in different forms of vaccine and we know it's safe. So if you're offered it and it's the right thing clinically to have, I would encourage everyone to go forward and still have it. It won't affect the fertility. Thank you very much for that answer. There's a question from Victoria that I will read out an interesting question saying there are new reports that many countries have made a commitment of applying different types for vaccines for their population and for those. Though previously international health agencies has, had recommended not to do this, what has scientifically changed on this aspect? Is the new practice safe? I would also like to know what is the available evidence on the vaccines currently developing uh, specifically preventing infectious diseases, pre-symptomatic. Yeah, as soon as the word is science is used, I look to Kevin. I don't know if... Um... I'm happy to take that. And, and Alexandra, was the first part of the question different types of vaccines being used in the same person? Yes, I think, um, I mean, the assumption oh. here is that previously it was recommended to do the second doses with the same type, and now some countries choose another type. Right. And this is this is one of the interesting things, right? Because as all of us, so I, I, I come from a Caribbean background, so I get the news from Jamaica as well as the UK news. So I'm always hearing different policies from the Caribbean and what's happening in the UK and trying to say, well, but what do I do? And so as you're here, the policy to this point has been take the first vaccine that you get, irrespective of which manufacturer it is, and then the NHS will commit to giving the second vaccine to being the same as you had the first. So that's the UK policy and that's what we've done so far. In the news earlier this week, some of you may have seen reports where the scientists are beginning to say as part of the preparation for the winter season, if we find that we need to boost the vaccines, then there could be an argument for boosting, not with the same vaccine that you got doses one and two, but with a different vaccine. So your body is challenged, your immune system is challenged in a new way to ensure that you have a stronger response to the virus. So that's the only policy change that, you know, is, is not even being considered, but that discussion is happening here. But as you've heard from Martin and I, the UK policy is start with a vaccine, whatever it is, you follow with the next vaccine, which will be the same company. And if in circumstances, the second vaccine is not available similar to the first, then you, you, your provider will say, actually, we will give you a second dose, which is different. But the policy is to keep them the same as much as possible. I think that's that's it for, for me on that one, Alexandra. Thank you. Uh, Martin, do you want to say something? You're on mute. Sorry, uh, we all do it. Um, yeah. uh, the, uh, the, the NHS is committed to following that policy. So we know that uh, uh, if I've had, as I said, the Pfizer vaccine, there is another dose waiting for me on the 5th of May when I'm due to have my second one. And, and that's a commitment we've made. Um, and, and the one thing that throws doubt in, we hear different things from different countries, as you say, but is this notion about, well, I had AstraZeneca and I'm young, should I have it a second time? Because I'm now thinking, the, and the answer is yes, it's safe to do that. And our policy hasn't changed. The science is always changing, not changing, growing, I think is a better way of putting it. We're learning every day about this. And, and I think, you know, uh, Kevin was asked a question a few weeks ago by a politician going, why didn't you tell us this back a year ago? And it's because we didn't know a year ago uh, and we're learning a lot. So, so uh, that may change in the future, but currently the policy stays the same. Thank you for this. Um, we have another question on the data and research from Ilse here, a, a question to Professor Fenton. Is the take up of vaccines among the Roma community part of the Public Health England research? It, it absolutely is. And thank you so much for that question because we are also seeing uh, differences in uptake with the Roma population as well. Some of it has to do with access to services some of it is due to uh, vaccine hesitancy, and some of it is due to some of the myths and misinformation that within the community, as we've engaged with the Roma community, we've been hearing about some of the, the misinformation which is circulating, and that uh, reduces confidence in the vaccine. So a big part of the work that we're doing, and I'm so glad you asked that question, is to work with Roma communities on both access and uptake and providing the information they need as well.
It's a great question. Thank you. There are quite a few questions on different symptoms and different pre-existing health conditions. So there's one interesting one from Magali here. If you suffer from allergies, is it safe to have any vaccines, Pfizer, AstraZeneca, or are there some vaccines to better avoid? Okay. So I'll, I'll start. El Medina, you may want to, to correct me or, or add to what I say. Um, so um, this is a, a, a synthetically produced, they're all synthetically produced vaccines. So there are very few ingredients in that that have any allergic reaction. Uh, um, I, I get my, my, my names a little up, but the, the one particular thing that people are concerned about with regard to allergies is an ingredient called Polyethyl, polyethylene glycol. I told you it was difficult to say. Uh, and, and for a very, very few people who already know this, who have had a severe and instant reaction. And when I mean severe, I mean absolutely can't breathe, everything swelling up seconds and minutes after the vaccine. That's why we wait 15 minutes. Um, uh, if you've had that sort of reaction in the past, you should not have the vaccine. There isn't an alternative vaccine. Uh, we only have three approved in this country. There are only five, I think, is it six in the world currently, but they all work in roughly the same way, all same. So, so for those few people who can't have it, they've just got to really be continue to be clear about hand space, space, ventilate, make sure that they look after themselves and don't put themselves at risk. Um, however, Lots of people have allergies, food allergies, um, uh, pollen allergies, seasonal allergies of all sorts. And for those people, this is absolutely safe. But what is usually needed is not just to say, well, Martin said it was safe, but a conversation when it's your turn with your nurse, with your doctor, whoever's there to go, this is my experience. Am I safe? So I can say generally, but when you're in clinic in front of me, I want to know about you, the patient, not the general population, but for the vast majority of people, this is yeah. absolutely safe, even if they've got allergies of some sort. I was just about to add in regards to the personal history. Unfortunately, most of the, the, the videos and the information being shared is generalized information. It doesn't take into consideration you as an individual with your personal medical needs. So you might suffer from anaphylaxis and you might have AAIs prescribed, but that's you. So you have a chat with your nurse, with your GP, with your uh, clinician at the hospital, and don't take into consideration the stuff being shared online because it's not relevant to you per se. It's just conspiracy theory for the general population. And I'm glad Martin mentioned that. And most, in most cases, what I'm recommending is if you have um, a diagnosis of anaphylaxis and you have AAI prescribed, then yes, do have a conversation with us first before you go ahead and have the vaccination. For the remaining population with pollen and hay fever, uh, that doesn't impact them and they, they should be vaccinated and protect themselves from much more serious condition, which is deadlier. Okay, thank you very much both. I think I would take uh, some rounds of like three quite similar questions on different symptoms and side effects so we can cover a bit more in the last 10 minutes before we end with a quick survey for people here. Um, so there's a question from Susie here. Should people with mi migraines and nosebleeds and vomiting from migraines have the AstraZeneca vaccine? There's one from Justina as well. Is hormonal contraception the reason to ask receive a specific type of vaccine to minimize the blood clot risk? And there's a question, pre-submitted question, another interesting one. Uh, does the vaccine has have uh, any side effects for people who have epilepsy? Can it trigger uh, epileptic symptoms? So if you could cover, like touch on all all those points that would be great now I'll take another round so we can cover more of them <laughs> thank you if I may say something in regard to uh, contraception the honest truth about contraception particularly for Central European and Southern European like Portugal uh, the most common usually one is the pill and the pill is actually at a much higher risk of um, giving you a blood clot than the vaccine so far. And if I may give you data, the um, 
the percentage of women on the pill that are at risk of getting a blood clot is between 500 to 1200 cases per million. But blood clot in vaccine, like uh, Martin McRae said, is one to two per million. So the comparison is huge. It's actually non-comparable. So on the contraception, again, have a chat with your GP, with your practice nurse, and they will be able to clarify this. And, and if necessary, maybe even change your contraceptive method to a safer one. So two in one, win-win there. You're mute, Martin. Well, thank you. I, do you want to work with me? You're brilliant. That's <laughs> so helpful. Thank you. Um, uh, on the epilepsy question, re re really uh, understandable question. Again, have that conversation with your trusted health professional. But what we would say is that if you have epilepsy, you, you would fall into that clinically vulnerable group where actually we'd want you to have the vaccine. Um, this will help you stay safe and live well rather than the opposite. So, so really, it, 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 is a, a positive, it is a positive thing. There's no evidence. A, a lot of blood conditions, uh, people who've had nosebleeds, people who've had clots in the past, all of those things, you know, th there's no direct link between those things. Um, this is a very, the, the clot we're talking about here is very rare and has a specific cause. There's a really good article by the woman from University College Hospitals London uh, who first reported the first signs of this uh, a couple of months ago in March and uh, a couple of weeks ago. Now. Um, so um, we, we would encourage people to have the vaccine. They are, uh, as El Medina says, there's no comparison about the risk here. And if I would again add in regards to the question for migraines and nosebleeds, it's very individual, isn't it? It's your situation. And the reason behind your migraines, the reason behind your nosebleeds, the medication you've been prescribed to manage them, all those need to be discussed with the person who knows you the best and not as a general question on a forum. It, we try to answer your questions, but in some cases, it has to be individualized. It has to be the care you need and not the one for the whole population. So do do uh, visit your health professional and have that conversation with them and clarify your doubts. Thank you very much both for, for this. We had a few questions on taking the vaccines in other countries and then being back in the UK. So for example, this question, does the NHS recognize partial or full COVID vaccination if obtained in the EU, regardless of the vaccine received? If I had my first dose in the EU, can I have my second dose in the UK? I think it's affects of a lot of European Londoners. Yeah. Um, so uh, the, the, there's really two parts to that. Um, and the second part is, do we recognize that you've been fully vaccinated? Well, remember at present, we don't have a process in this country of giving you some sort of vaccine passport. That is being debated. It, it, it was part of the roadmap. There'll be a discussion around whether we certificate people for having it. I have personal views on that, but that's not relevant for today. Uh, what's relevant is, I think that first part of the question is, if I've partially been vaccinated, can I get the second dose here? Well, uh, Matty, I think you were really clear before about you know, the vaccine, it's treatment for the virus, treatment for testing, they're all free in this country, whoever you are, wherever you come from. And yes, if you come and you present and say, look, I've had the vaccine, part first dose somewhere else, we'll take that into account. That's a one-to-one -one discussion with your clinician. But, but there is nothing saying, oh, you've had it over there, so you can't have it. There's no, there's no blanket rule like that. It is, it is absolutely about the individual need in this case. Uh, and we are permissive as a nation to say, we will pay for your vaccine if you need it. Thank you very much for that. I think there's still uh, quite a lot of, of questions. I mean, there's one here maybe on, uh, yeah, on the Sputnik vaccine. Are there any plans to buy and distribute the Sputnik vaccine in the UK? I read last week that a couple of EU countries are considering it. So I'm curious if this is uh, in a pipeline here in the UK as well. So yeah, what's the latest information on that one? So, so I missed the first bit. What sort of vaccine did you say at the beginning? The Sputnik vaccine. Oh, Sputnik. 
um, the, the, the one developed in Russia. Um, yeah. So as far as I'm aware, uh, we have no um, uh, uh, commercial arrangement with the producers of Sputnik to bring that into this country. Um, uh, uh, the government uh, for the UK as a whole entered into a number of contractual arrangements long before we even knew the vaccines were going to be available. Um, uh, uh, but, but the Russian one was not one of the ones we went into. Now, that's not to rule it out at all. Um, and I'm sure that the, uh, the, the national government will be considering that all the time. What I'm really grateful for is that we didn't um, put all of our eggs into the one basket of one vaccine. So we could have said, oh, well, we'll go with Johnson & Johnson or AstraZeneca and nothing else. And then we would have we could be in problems. So we've actually got a range of vaccines now coming on screen. There's more we think coming along, and there's more being developed as we speak, um, but not Sputnik at present. But it's it's only a commercial decision made a few months ago that has driven that. Thank just, you. Just very very quickly, that, you know, in the months ahead, we're likely to see other vaccines coming from other European countries. I'm just looking at a a chart here that says the Germans are coming out with one, the French are coming out with ones, as well as um, uh, the Chinese vaccines are coming out as well. So because many of us have connections with our home countries, our countries in Europe, Australia, we may well see the situation where people either have access to different vaccines abroad and then have to take up their course here, or they have to think about you know, which vaccine they take. But the, again, just to reassure you that the policy here is please take the first vaccine that you're offered in the UK so you can get that first dose and that's most important. Thank you very much both. I think we have time only for two very brief uh, questions. There are some questions, I'm trying to group them into some themes. Uh, there are some questions around uh, whether uh, we need to follow the rules after we had the vaccines. Um, and whether it can be like any third wave, even if a lot of people do get vaccinated now, a lot of people seem to be concerned about that, what to do after they had their vaccine. So if you can address that, then I think I'll pick one other very short one before we just wrap up the event. Yeah, so, so, uh, so, so, so the, rule, the, 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 the rules that, the, that were in at any point, you need to follow where you, whether you've had the vaccine or not. It's really, really important. Remember, the vaccine is not 100% coverage, yeah? It, it absolutely reduces your chance of dying or serious illness, about 85% to 90% effectiveness. That's brilliant for a vaccine, but it's not 100%. And we don't know, as variants and things change, whether that will last. So there will be, th there are thoughts already about boosters in the autumn, Kevin's already mentioned them, but follow the rules. So get the vaccine and follow the rules, and, and then those rules will last for less time. And as a nation, as a city, we'll come out of this quicker if we all do that. And a risk of a third wave is a, of another wave is, is a real one because we know what's happening in Europe with many countries now experiencing an increase in coronavirus levels. Plus, although we're moving very quickly to vaccinate as many people as possible, there's still likely to be a, a sizable proportion of our population that isn't fully vaccinated as we get into the, the, the spring and summer. So that risk is always going to be there of the, vaccine, of the virus taking off again, which is why, you know, do this, the vaccine isn't the answer, it's part of the answer. And that is what I call combination prevention, hands, face, space, ventilate, and vaccinate. All five of those things we need together to, to really help to keep the rate low. And don't be, don't be disappointed by the fact that we still have to social distance, we still have to minimize contact one-to-one uh, -one or family-wide. There, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. I mean, um, news came out of Israel today that together with their social distancing and the lockdowns they've had and the vaccination, it's flatlined. The numbers of new cases has almost disappeared. And that is a beautiful place to be in. And that is where we want to be. So just take that into consideration and continue following the rules and be vaccinated. And we will get there. Yeah, absolutely. 
Thank you very much uh, for the encouraging message as well. Just a very final quick question uh, before we wrap, wrap up the event. I think it's really important for a lot of uh, EU Londoners. There's um, a question saying, well, my sister is pregnant. Uh, she has been invited to get her vaccine. Um, should she get the vaccine? Her health professionals do not seem to agree. So I think, yeah, something around, there are a few questions around pregnancy as well in here. Uh so, <laughs> if I may um, jump in very quickly, please. and then uh, I, she has health professionals who are not agreeing with the fact that she should get the vaccine, then maybe she needs to explore that more with them because they know her history, they know her, her body, her system, and they would have a rationale. So that, that would be me. Explore the reason why with your doctor, with your midwife, because they know you more, better than we do, but. I think that's a perfect answer. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much all. I think a lot of the, there are a lot more questions that we've received, but a lot of them are really specific about specific health conditions. So as Dina and others said, I think it's actually very important to have those conversations Absolutely. with your health professionals uh, and to get to get the answers from them. But I do hope we try to cover like a lot of different topics today. So thank you again to everyone uh, answering the questions and asking the questions and uh, on speaking on the panel. Just before you go, I'll just run a couple of questions, a couple of Zoom polls, if you can just stay all for like one one more minute i don't think you can answer them on facebook but you can write in the comments your opinions if if you want to um so i'll just uh try to run a quick quick poll here um i'm not sure i can nicolas because you're the host actually <laughs> i think the poll is on your end so ah, there uh, you here go. Go. yes uh yeah, so the first question is, uh, yes, if you're registered with the GP, so if you can just, uh, yeah, please click on that in the next 10 seconds or so. Thank you. And I have a second question and then we'll just uh, wrap up the event. And the second question. Do I have the second question, Nicolas? Oh, oh. wow. So uh, only... Only 4% not register with the GP. So yeah, go and register with the GP. Uh, Matteo already explained that yeah, everyone can. It's very easy. So yes, do, go and do it. And the second question, please. Uh, yes, if you have had or are you planning to have the COVID vaccine? So what's your opinion on that? As well, keeping it open for a few, a few seconds for everyone to, to respond. Okay, and then we'll see the results. Hopefully this meeting has been useful to answer some questions. Uh, we know there's so many concerns. I mean, there, I see so many different questions on different Facebook groups and forums, and it's good to have an informed informed decision. Oh, that's great. So the, the vast majority uh, are planning to have the COVID vaccine or have had it. There's still a bit of um, a few people being unsure, and I hope the information today has um, has helped with, with that. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I think that's that's it for the event. We'll do a follow-up for everyone who registered. Some useful links, some messages in different languages, some public health information. Uh, I hope people found this helpful. Thank you so much again to everyone who helped organize this event, uh, to all the panelists, to Professor Kevin Fenton and Martin McRae for answering the questions, and of course, Dina for answering the questions as well, and Matteo, who's speaking from a community perspective. So I hope everyone found this useful. Um, follow the links after we send the email, uh, share this uh, recording as well, like on, on Facebook, if you're watching on Facebook, this will still be there, the recording. So do share it on different nationality groups uh, of EU Londoners, because I think a lot of people will appreciate having this information and a lot of the questions that we have are quite similar. So I do hope this was useful. Thank you so much, everyone, and uh, have, have a good evening.